Okay, good morning. We're going to get it started. So we are continuing our uh, study of the Chazan Isha's Amunah Ubitachon, Faith and Trust, his uh, outstanding work in which he articulates exactly the definitions of these uh, qualities. One of the important notions, uh, points that he makes and others make is that ultimately Amuna and Bitachon are not philosophical abstract ideas, but they're midos. The same way patience is a midah, is a character trait. The same way generosity is a character trait. The same way kindness is a character trait. Emuna is not a philosophy. It's not something reserved for a philosophical discourse, but it's actually a character trait. It's something that you work on. It's something that you acquire. It's something that you hone and that you build within yourself. We, we like to describe Emuna as a muscle. The more you work it out, the bigger it becomes. And the less you work it out, the sooner it atrophies and it dies. So the Chazanish had been talking about, again, the definition of Bitachon is not, I trust that Hashem will make everything work out the way I want. But that the definition of bitachon is, I trust that whatever Hashem has happened is in my best interest. I may not understand it, I may not appreciate it, I may not welcome it, but whatever happens is my best. And then last week we spoke about that the arena of bitachon and amuna is not on the lips, but is in the heart. Meaning, it's easy to talk about Baruch Hashem, Be'ezra Hashem, Amir Hashem. It's easy to talk, 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 talk about amuna, but when amuna comes into play, a person hears challenging news, a person gets stuck in traffic, a person, a uh, competitor opens across the street from them. Amun is not about the lips, it's not about telling and preaching Amunah. Amun is about in your heart feeling and trusting that Hashem's got a plan, Hashem provides, and that there's a higher order and purpose to everything. So it brings us up to page 5253. We're in Amunah Bitachon, we're on the chapter of Bitachon, Os Vav. Im ki ikari habitachon mechovas halev. Says the Chazanish, even though the main point, the main arena, the main venue for displaying trust on Hashem is in your heart, it's nothing that anybody sees. It's about the deep breath that you take. You know, I just met somebody's going in for uh, a significant surgery, and they met with me because they're feeling very, very anxious, very anxious. So I said to them the advice I gave them, which it's easier to give as advice than it is to put into practice oneself. So I don't mean to minimize it in any way. But what I said is, look, you trust your doctor? Yes. You followed all their orders, everything you're supposed to do? Yes. You uh, made the preparation? Yes. Okay, so the re- you've done everything you can do that's in your power. If your nervousness, your anxiety stems from the fact that you haven't done what you need to do, so nervousness then can be a catalyst for a positive outcome. But if you've done everything you need to do, what's the nervousness leading to? So the Chazanich said, what are you nervous about? What are you nervous about? It'll be as it'll be. Because Baruch is in charge. Whatever is going to happen is for a reason. It's not random. You've done what you can do. And now to be nervous is simply a form of heresy. To be nervous simply undermines your trust that Hashem is also going to be in that operating room. He's going to be there. But it's more than that. It's that where does Amunah happen? It's not a matter of, you know, you go around and tell everybody, yeah, Mir Hashem out of the surgery. Oh, Be'ez Hashem. Oh, Hashem is going to make me surgery. And then you sit in there schwitzen and spilkes and going crazy out of your mind. So you did well with emunah and bitachon on your lips, but you fail, a failing grade on your emunah and bitachon in your heart. Where it matters is in your heart. And what I told him is that, I try to practice this myself, it's a difficult uh, thing to achieve, but you can't control when thoughts come knocking, but you can control whether you let them in or not. We can't always control whether they come knocking. We can control whether we let them in. So the nervousness, the anxiety, the, uh, the concern... That thought is going to knock, and that's okay. That's legitimate. That's totally understandable. But whether you dwell on that thought, and whether you submit and give in to that thought, and forfeit yourself to that thought, that's up to you. That's up to you. You don't have to give in to every thought. Did I tell you before this metaphor, the chassid and the rebbe? I love this. I saw this years ago. It changed my life. About the chassid who was up all night, anxious, nervous, concerned. What's going to be with this, that, and the other thing? So he goes to the rebbe's house told you this? If I did, you don't remember. It's like repeat it anyway. He goes to the Rebbe's house and he says, uh, knocks on the front door. There's no answer. So he knocks even harder. He's desperate. He needs to talk to his Rebbe. There's no answer. He goes around the side of the house and he looks in the window and the Rebbe's sitting at the dining room table studying Torah. So he starts to knock on the window. The Rebbe doesn't even look up, doesn't let him in. He goes home, despond and dejected. The next morning he comes to Shul. He down, down, he's over. He comes up to his Rebbe. He says, Rebbe, I needed you last night. I needed the Rebbe last night. I was anxious and nervous, concerned. I need a Rebbe. So the Rebbe turns to his chassid and he says, I know your concern, I already answered you. He says, no, my concern, you answered me. We didn't even get a chance to talk, you didn't let me in. What do you mean? 
So the Rebbe said, and he said, Rebbe, I have nerves and I'm anxiety and concerns and I'm struggling with the fear of this and this distraction and that Yitzhahara. So the Rebbe says, I know, and I answered you. You know how you came to my house last night and you knocked, but the choice was up to me whether to let you in or not? Those thoughts come knocking, but you have the choice whether to let them in or not. You can't control what thought knocks, you can control what you allow in and whether you give yourself over to it and become distracted by it. So and that, that was the advice I said to this person. Is, I said, you know, as the days come closer to the scheduled surgery, totally understandable that the, the thoughts will come knocking. Don't ever forget you have the choice of whether to let those thoughts in or not. You've done everything you need to do. This is when you... And why am I saying this? Because again, the Chazanish begins. Ikara bitachon mechovas haleiv. Bitachon is not the fact that you told everybody around you, oh, Hashem is going to make my surgery. It's what do you feel in your heart. It's whether we let the thoughts knock. There are practical mitzvahs connected to it, the obligation to refrain from acting against others, and there are some limitations relating to the efforts that one is allowed to make. In other words, bitachon is not just in the abstract. Bitachon is not some esoteric idea that I, I trust Hashem. Bitachon as halacha lamaisa. There are everyday implications of living a life of faith in Hashem. How I relate to others. Am I going to undercut and seek to destroy my competitor? Or do I say, look, Hashem is in charge. If He wants both of us to make a living, we'll both make a living and thrive. Somebody hurt me. Do I seek to take revenge? Or do I say, look, they're accountable for what they did. But if Hashem didn't want me to get hurt, I wouldn't have gotten hurt. Hashem is involved in this picture. Even within how much I have to work is a question of emunah and bitachon. If I believe, you know, there is such a thing, Sefer Achinach, Techovah, Salavavos, both describe, there is such a thing as working excessively. A person who, who, who neglects their family, neglects their own avodas Hashem, neglects Dav, neglects all this thing because they're working 16, 17, 18, 20 hours a day because they think that'll make them richer, that'll bring them more money. That's excessive work. You can't sit on your couch all day and do nothing and say Hashem will provide. If you fail to do your initiative, you can't, that's a fake form of trust. You have to take initiative. But you could take too much initiative where you erase God from the equation. Excessive work, because if Hashem wants to make you rich in 12 hours of work, 8 hours of work, 10 hours of work, you can make you rich working 8 hours. You're starting to work excessively, 14, 16, 18 hours a day, that's excessive work. So says the Chazanish, even when you calculate what's reasonable, and what's excessive amount of work that you're doing? And here, underline this if you're going to keep this booklet, where he says the following, we have an obligation to consider carefully every act before we do it, how is it compatible or incompatible with a sense of emuna and bitachon? Everything we're going to say, every choice we're going to make, every negotiation, every deal we're going to strike, everything we're going to do, we have a responsibility to ask ourselves, is this compatible with bitachon or not? I'm freaking out at the waiter. I'm in a harsh negotiation. I'm angry at my children. I'm, taking, I'm undermining my competitor. I'm leaving the doctor's office with whatever I just heard from the doctor. With everything, with every emotion, with every reaction, with every response, we have to ask ourselves, is this compatible or incompatible? How does this stim with the midah of bitachon? Do you remember that Yosef HaTzadik was only supposed to spend a certain amount of time in prison and he spent more time. And Chazal tell us, why was Yosef punished so harshly that he was destined to spend longer than originally? Do you remember why? Chazanish says, he reminds us, Chazal tell us because when Sarah Mashkin was getting released from prison and Yosef, who had befriended him because he cared enough about him, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but Yosef says to Sarah Mashkin when he leaves prison, his kartani, don't forget, to, don't forget me, R- remember me, and remind Paro about me. Get me out of here. And Chazal say that that was beyond a normative hishtabdus, that was more than an initiative. Yosef in that moment didn't see that act as, oh, please remind them about me, as a form of initiative. He saw that as he put his trust in the Saramashkin. 
For that moment, he forgot that God was going to determine whether he was released or not. And he put too much faith and trust in the Saddam Ashkim. And for that, he was punished. That's the level of accountability to which we are held about whether we have faith and trust to realize that in every decision, action, behavior, is this compatible? Where does bitachon fit into what I'm going Whatever I'm going through right now, where does bitachon fit in? Where does it fit in? It should be part of our calculus, part of the calculation of our attitude through life. What was I going to tell you about Yosef is a tangent, but do you know what day it was that Yosef was in prison that, that uh, Yosef begins to go free? It was the day that uh, the Chazal tell us, our rabbis tell us, it was the day, you remember Yosef's in prison with the Sarah Mashkim and Sarah Ofim. Yosef is in prison with the baker and the wine bearer, and they're languishing in prison. And the Pasuk, I forgot the Pasuk, but Yosef looks over and sees that their face is very drawn, they're very despond, they're very sad, they're very sad. So Yosef turns to them and he says, what's the matter, my brothers, what's going on? What's going on? They say, well, it's actually, it's nice of you to ask, but, you know, we were put here and we had these dreams, and Yosef interprets the dreams, and so on. And Chazal say, what began the process of freedom for Yosef was taking notice of the pain of others. Yosef had every right sitting in prison to feel very, uh, to feel very, to focus on himself. Here he is, cast away by his brothers, abandoned by his father, falsely accused by his master to whom he brought great riches and success. He's sitting in prison. He has every reason to wallow in his own sorrow and say, the heck with everybody else. How could this happen to me? But he doesn't. He notices these two other people and he says, what's the matter? Why are you so sad? Is there anything I can do for you? And it was in that moment of asking, noticing the pain of someone else and asking that he began to attain his personal freedom. This, by the way, is this Mida of Yosef is absolutely confirmed by research and science today. You have, uh, Esti Lupin, our social worker, can confirm. You have people who are struggling with depression. One of the treatments for depression, sometimes it requires medical treatment. It's very important. It shouldn't be neglected. But one of the therapies uh, for uh, depression is to volunteer. It's unbelievable. The amount of research that shows that the way to break out of depression is to volunteer. It's counterintuitive. What do you mean? If you're depressed, so go to Neiman Marcus. Go to <laughs> Saks Fifth Avenue. If you're depressed, <laughs> you, that also works. Okay. <laughs> it comes from a clinician. Is that your clinical experience? If you're depressed, if you're depressed, have like a caramel frappuccino at Starbucks. You know, if you're depressed, go spoil yourself with something. But the research shows that actually, if you're depressed, the more you focus on yourself, the deeper your depression. The way to break out of the depression is to volunteer to care about. Other people, Yosef exhibited that already a long time ago. But anyway, the Chazanish says, you see the level of accountability. Yosef doesn't say, oh, I'm banking on Hashem, what does he want me to do? Let me, it's part of my initiative, part of my ishtablis is to remind the Saramashkim, when you get out of here, don't forget me. He doesn't think that. At that moment, he feels, oh, this is my way out. The Saramashkim. Hey, Saramashkim, when you get out of here, don't forget about me. To which Hashem says, no, 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 no. I'm your way out. That might be the means to your way out, but don't ever confuse the two. At that moment, Yosef's bitachon was clouded, and he was therefore held accountable. And that's the degree to which in everything we do, part of the matrix, part of the calculation, part of our attitude, our thought process, our conversation has to be, where do emuna and bitachon fit in? V'amru, ashri ha-geva asher sam Hashem nivtachon. It's a fantastic pasuk in Tehillim. Ashri ha-geva asher sam asher sam Hashem nivtachon. Happy is the person, fortunate is the person who places his trust, her trust in Hashem. Ze Yosef, v'lofana al rehavim, she b'shvil shepana al Sarah Mashkim, mizvasef lo shtei shanim. Because he put his trust in the Sarah Mashkim, he sat in prison two extra years. What's a lomar? Yosef yada she'ein hatzlacha so tluya, v'ishtablis v'akom yad Hashem. Of course, Yosef got the last name Hatzadik, not by chance. Yosef called it Tzadik because he's a righteous person. Of course he knew that everything relied on Hashem. But because he approached the chief butler, it was decreed he would stay in prison at the additional years. Every, he knew everything comes from Hashem, but since human beings are obligated to act and not to depend on miracles, Yosef obligated himself to make use of the opportunity and to enlist the help of the chief butler. But it's not in the nature of people of that rank to remember and to do favors. And therefore, this act of Yosef was not appropriate. It was an act of desperation. A desperate person does anything he can, even futile actions, which someone who trusts in Hashem should not do. He's not obligated to take such actions. This act of Yosef, as it were, 
were akin to throwing dust on the glory of his faith and trust in Hashem. Since it was not obligatory, it was forbidden. So Chazanish is saying that Yosef asking the Saramashkin to remember him was something which was out of the ordinary. Somebody like the Saramashkin would never remember him. So it was an act of desper- desperation. And an act of desperation is a violation of trust in Hashem. Our sages here are referring to Yosef's action, not to the extent of his trust of, tra- tra- of trust. Yosef knew that no human being could help him, only Hashem. But his feeling of obligation to ask the chief butler, according to the tradition of our sages, came from a mistaken judgment. He should not have turned to untrustworthy sources of help. Again, we're not held to that standard. It's very difficult to us to calculate what fits in under the rubric of initiative and what should be left to trust. Should I not go to the doctor? Should I not follow up on the phone call with the meeting? Should I not try to negotiate? Should I not try... You know, what fits in? We should do our hishtadlis, our effort, our initiative, maybe even erring on the side of initiative. It's hard to calculate what the recipe calls for, how much initiative and how much trust. But we're simply learning from the fact that Yosef, who was held to such a high standard because he was such a righteous, virtuous individual, and look at the accountability for him by the fact that he put his trust in an untrustworthy source, what a mistake it was to a certain degree. I don't know if I should say this being recorded, even if it weren't, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, al tiv techu I think about that pasuk every day these days. Don't... Don't place your trust in elected officials, in, in, in princes, in, uh, in, in dignitaries, in diplomats. Don't put your trust in Benidivim. Don't put, don't put your trust there. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think that we, we have legitimate concerns about the impact of elected officials in this country and other countries on our people's future, on our individual future. And we should have that concern. And it's important to have that concern. And those concerns should impact how we vote and on whose behalf we campaign. campaign. But when we are too... When we, when we think the future is too much in the hands of those people, if that person is elected, Israel will be destroyed, this will be end of that, this is over. Like, when you put too much trust that destiny can be shaped by an untrustworthy source... That's also a violation of Emuna and Bitachem. So again, in the human realm, these people are going to make real policy decisions that will have real impact. And that should certainly influence how we vote, on whose behalf we campaign, how well informed we are. I'm not suggesting that we be ignorant, sit at home and don't vote. Absolutely, we have to do that. You know how involved in APAC we are. Advocacy is so critically important. But excessive advocacy can undermine Bitachem when you start to believe that it's not Hashem who has the master plan, and maybe some of these things are puppets in that master plan, you start to put too much faith in the puppets, and you forget there's a master plan. You become too depressed. If you become too depressed, that's also a violation of Amuna. Hashem's got a plan. There's a way out. We've been in much harder situations. If you're too depressed, there's a lot of reasons to be depressed today. There's a lot of reasons to be depressed. On the present and the future, there's a lot of reasons to be depressed. If you're too depressed, that's also a failure of Amuna and Bitachon. You've not got out of the equation of the possibility of what the future can hold. Don't put trust in untrustworthy sources. Okay, Ozayim, bottom of page 5455. Yesh od mimidas habitachon. Ki oz there's more to the trait of trust. A holy spirit rests on the one who trusts in Hashem, accompanied by a strength of spirit that tells him that Hashem will indeed help him. It's an amazing thing. The more you trust in Hashem, the more you can draw strength from that trust. The more that you fail to trust in Hashem, the more on your own you are. The more on your own you are. So the more you trust in Hashem, the more strength and power that He gives you. And the less you trust in Hashem and you think it's up to you, it's not, you're on your own, kid, good luck in life, then the more lonely and the more pain that you're in. So a person who succeeds in this area of emuna and bitachon, of trust, a spirit of Hashem descends upon them. Because what really happens when you think about it? How does bitachon work? Bitachon is a sense of consciousness and mindfulness. One of the areas that I want to research and hopefully write about, and I have dreams and aspirations one day of a book about, um, over the course of this mini sabbatical I'm taking, is the area of mindfulness and Judaism. I have a theory, a thesis, 
you know, it's very big right now in psychology, the uh, notion of mindfulness. That happiness directly correlates with mindfulness. That meaning and purpose in life directly correlate with mindfulness. That's the catchword today, mindfulness. I believe that all of Torah and all of Judaism is a platform and a prescription for leading a mindful life. From beginning from Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid, that from when we wake up in the morning we're supposed to see God opposite us always, to the fact that the Torah legislates and regulates how you tie your shoes, what goes in your mouth, what comes out of your mouth, what you think about, what you look at, what you see, what you say, what you, after you come out of the bathroom. It's a mindfulness of appreciation. It's a mindfulness in relationships. It's a mindfulness of time. It's a mindfulness of pleasure. It's a mindfulness of, of, of diet and of discipline. Every aspect of Jewish law is really reinforcing an attitude of mindfulness, of consciousness, of presence in all that we do. And it begins with emuna and bitachon. That if you live your life at every moment with a sense that Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit, that Hashem is always with me, always and forever, consistently, wherever I am, Hashem is there. He's part of the calculation, and that should inform how I act and who I am and what I say and how I behave and how I react. It's a, the way Shulchan Aruch begins, that every Jew every day should live life as if opposite them were Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit. God is opposite us. Hashem is always with me, everywhere and in every moment. If you felt that were true, by the way, you go somewhere with somebody, you walk into a room with a very powerful figure, you're going to have a very different attitude. You're going to have much less worry and concern and fear, and you're going to feel a lot more confidence and trust. If you get stuck in a situation, but you're with a very powerful person, you, you, there'll, there'll be a way out. You know there'll be a way out. And that's the attitude. Wherever we are and whenever we are, that Hashem is always with us, a mindfulness, a consciousness, that Hashem is always with us. So when the Chazanish describes that a person who succeeds in exercising the emuna and bitachon muscle, a person who acquires the attribute of emuna and bitachon, then the Ruach Kodesh, Mislave Imo, the Holy Spirit rests on them, and Mislave really means travels with them. Well, that makes a lot of sense. If God is always with you, then God will always be with you. <laughs> if God is always with you because you've chosen to bring Him into everything you do, then He'll be there with every difficult decision or every piece of information or news or every disappointment moment or every happy moment, and joyous moment, and successful moment. Hashem will always be there. You'll feel the Spirit of Hashem and that will guide you. As David HaMelech said, Im alay lo yirali bi. We're going to say this every day of Elul. If you bring a host upon me, my heart will have no fear. Im takum alay If... Uh, a war comes upon me, bezos ani boteach. Which Chazal, I'm a first of a big discussion. What's the bezos? And this, I will trust. But in any case, means, if I am successful in having Hashem with me always, a war could come upon me. But bezos ani boteach, I'll always trust Hashem. This matter varies according to the level of the person's trust and his degree of holiness. In other words, the conviction of a person who has complete trust in Hashem can indeed bring about a good outcome as opposed to a bad one. We also have this idea in psychology that there's a notion of negative energy and positive energy. And that the energy and the aura that we put off creates a reality around us. If you carry yourself with a negative energy, you create a negative reality. If you're uh, depressed, you know, everything is negative and everything is a hypercriticism and everything is judgmental and everything is you're fabissima and you're miserable and you're this and you're that, you create that reality around you in your relationships and in your health. And in your destiny, it's just all negative air, negative energy. And on the other hand, if you have a positive energy, everything is optimistic and upbeat and hopeful, and everything's positive, and everything's going to work out, and everything's great, and everything's good, then, uh, then you're going to create that reality. You know, we all exchange these, these courtesy greetings of how you're doing. No one really cares about the answer. Nobody really follows up on the answer. But there's really two types of answers. There's people who say, I hate when people say, can't complain. That's the reality. You say everything's great. Your eyes are working, your feet are working, your ears are working, your mouth's working, there's a roof over your head, you have a car to drive, you have food in your mouth, you have a family. If you're fortunate, if you're blessed, you have, you have blessings. What do you mean? It's not can't complain. Can't complain? Can't complain? Look back at the generations of Jewish people and of history, the circumstances in which we had to live, the pain, the persecution, the pogroms, the disappointments, the challenges. And the best we got on the way out of Starbucks with your triple uh, 
cappuccino, caramel, whatever, on your way into your air-conditioned car with your power steering, power windows, power this, with your phone, which can talk into and tells you where there's traffic so you'll never sit in traffic again in your life. And there's a police in your tent. And your answer, how's life? I can't complain. I want to complain, but I can't complain. I, my default is to complain. I wish I had something to complain about. Yesterday, tomorrow, but today I can't complain. It's not can't complain. Fantastic. Everything is fantastic. And even when it's not fantastic, it's fantastic. Whatever's not fantastic is infinitely more fantastic than what not fantastic looks like. Thank God, how's life? It's fantastic. So we have an energy, a positive or a negative energy. We're either living life with bitachon or we're not. You know, there's no agnostic in life. There's no agnostic. There's three choices in philosophy. You go to Philosophy 101 in college and you can have a believer, you can have an atheist, and you can have an agnostic. The believer believes there's a God, there's a creator of the universe who's intimately involved in his or her life every day. The atheist, there's no God, random chance we came to be by fluke, there's nothing. The agnostic says, I don't know, I'm not sure. It's possible, yes, possible, no. I'm unconvinced, maybe, maybe. So, you know, that's nice in the, in the classroom of philosophy. But in life, you're either leading your life as a believer or you're leading your life as an atheist. You can't lead your life as an agnostic. There's no lifestyle that goes with an agnostic. You're either making decisions in your life and bringing God into your life, or you've kicked him out of your life and you're assuming he's not involved in your life. You can't hedge in your life. Well, I'm not sure if he exists, so here's how I hedge. You know, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I live with God there. And uh, Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I live as if God doesn't. You're either a believer or you're an atheist. You can't live an agnostic lifestyle. But you can be a believer and not be a practicing Jew. So that's why there's all different Jewish levels. Well, you can be a believer and not be an observant Jew of, of halacha, right. correct? Because maybe you believe he's here, he created the universe, but you don't believe he gave us these minutia detailed laws. Maybe you do, but you can't overcome your temptations. All of us, Chazal say, Mepharshim say that um, every time that we, I hate the word sin, but every time that we... Um, miss the mark. Miss the mark, okay. <laughs> But every time that we um, have an indiscretion, it's an act of heresy. Because at the moment, that you, you, it's, it's simply impossible to believe that God exists and He wants this from you, and to violate that. So if we're violating it, it means we had a moment of insanity. We had this a few weeks ago in Parshas Naso, when it says, Isha, when a woman, we call her a sota. Sota comes from the um, sin tes he, which means like a shota, somebody who's, who's lost their mind. Because at the moment, and that's what happens. It happens in the extreme sometimes, right? At the moment that a person does a terrible indiscretion and loses their whole life because a moment of weakness, that they literally lost their mind. They, they, it was a moment of insanity. It's a moment of insanity induced by a moment of the pleasure of the flesh, right? You could have a moment of insanity which is induced by all sorts of reasons, but it's a moment of insanity. And the same is true with us. When we violate God's will... If we really believe God exists, at that moment there was a moment of insanity. We really denied God existed at that moment. It's the only way that you could do that, is that you, for that moment, denied that, denied God exists, or denied that's what He wants from you, or denied there's a consequence for not listening. So we have these moments of insanity, these moments of denial Isn't that, that we go the through. That's the Yetzirah. Yeah, people absolutely. that are like reform and conservative, like I find, I mean, people that are real they're believers, they really believe in God, and, and you're saying that when they violate things that, like, that we would practice, like keeping Shabbat or whatever, there's a moment of insanity and they're back. I think it's more complicated than that. I think that a person's background, their childhood, right. their education has a major impact on who they are. So I think many of those people are Tinoch Shanishpa. They weren't exposed to, they weren't raised with the premise that this is absolute truth and it's non-negotiable and it's binding. So for them, what they were raised with is that there's a creator of the universe as God and I'm a proud Jew and here's what I have to do. In other words, they're absolutely observant within their denomination of what observance means to them. So, but, but sticking within our denomination, we too. I mean, how do you talk Lashon Hara? God told you don't talk Lashon Hara. No, we have a moment we talk Lashon Hara. God said, I want you to dive with Kavana. Then our mind laps and we don't have Kavana. God said, I want you to be honest on your taxes. Never ever take a, a business, a, a lunch with a friend as a business expense and people give in to their weakness. How does that happen? If you believe God created the universe, this is what He wants from you. He'll be terribly disappointed. There are consequences to violating. So how does it happen? The only way it happens is because at that moment, we have this moment of insanity. We're in denial. Either that He exists, or that He asked of us that, or that there are consequences for it. But if we live 
that's what the Chazanish is saying and is ending this chapter of Bitachon with this is that if we are mindful if we dedicate our lives to living a conscientious presence the, the, the cognizance that Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid Hashem is involved in my life always well Hashem is sitting right in the room I'm not going to tell you Lashon Hara I'll wait till he leaves Oh, he never leaves? He's always in the room? I guess i got to keep the Lashon Hara to myself. Right? Hashem's in the room. I'm not going to watch this. Yeah, I, it's shocking to me. I'm not going to rewrite this because I already wrote that article once when I wrote the article about the Shades of Grey. But the amount of proudly, staunchly observant Jews who, who show off about watching series of TV shows which have blatantly violence, rape, and nudity I've read about, I haven't seen, but how many from Jews are talking about their obsession with this show called Game of Thrones? Okay, you have a Yetzirah, you watched it, you're keeping up with it, I'm not judging you, keep it to yourself. Everyone, we have mistakes, we have shortcomings, we have failures, we keep it to ourselves. But from passionately sincere Erlich, I hate the word from, Rabbi Klein, Zichron Levrach used to say, a Galach is from, a Jew is Erlich, it means a priest is from, a Jew is Erlich, from I can't, you, can't, you can't do justice to translating that. But you have Ehrlich people, very sincere people, and they, they, they're, they're from, they dabble with Kavana, and they dress sneers and this, and they're on Facebook, oh, I can't wait for the next episode. I'm not, I'm, I'm nobody here, I'm not judging anybody. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you, you read, you see, that's what's incompatible. That's what there should be, a sense of shame. A little sense of shame, a little sense of busha. It's my Yitzhahara. I gave into my Yitzhahara. Everybody's talking about the series, I checked it out, I got hooked, I watch it. It's an admission. It's my Yitzhahara. Okay. No, I'm not saying, I've never watched the show in my life. I'm not making an admission now. I'm saying somebody who says that, okay, it's an admission. But to show off about it, to brazenly, boldly show off about it. So forget the other denominations. And forget anyone else. Just look into ourselves. We all make mistakes. So would we watch, that's what I was saying. Would you watch that show if Hashem were sitting on the couch next to you? Hey Hashem, new episode of Game of Thrones, let's check it out together. <laughs> would, you watch, would you watch the show with him sitting next to you? Would you go there or say that or listen to this or act like that or do this or do that? I just, you know, all of us, we, people use nibble pad, they use curse words. People use, uh, there's a million things, we, I, I have my own shortcomings. We speak Lashon Hara, we look at things we shouldn't look at. I'm not, I'm not judging anyone else. I have my own many, many shortcomings. And I can tell you, every time I have that shortcoming, it's a failure to remember that Hashem is in the room. And when are you at your best? You know, all the time, whenever we have a Shiva minion or there's a person who, for whatever reason, is transporting a Sefer Torah, they'll always talk about the fact that the Torah was in the house meant everyone behaved differently. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the Torah was in the house, so yeah. you couldn't do the normal things you did. You know, people spoke differently, did this differently, dressed differently, acted differently, Sefer Torah is in the room. That's Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid. Hashem is always in the room. Hashem's always in the room. Whatever room, wherever you go, Hashem's always in the room. So, you know, that could get awkward at times, but Hashem is always in the room, even in those moments, because it means that there's a holiness, a sanctity that, that, that rules everything. In, in moments of affection, in, in, in the bathroom, and coming in the shower, there's, there's ways to behave that are um, dignified and that are godly in every scenario, in every situation that are, that are sacred and that are, and that are holy. And so this Shivisi Hashem and Egdi Samid should inform and inspire everything we do. And when we don't, when we forget, for a minute, for an hour, for a day, for a month, for a year, all of us struggle at different periods of our life with forgetting that Hashem is in the room, it has its impact. It has its impact. So that's what the Chazanish is ending his section on Amun Abitachon with the statement that if, you, if we all can get committed to flexing the Amunah muscle and to cultivating the amuna attribute within ourselves, if we can succeed in taking Hashem with us always, and He's always in the room, the bracha that we will find, it's going to transform our lives, our marriage. Our pe- Would you scream at your kids if Hashem were in the room? Would you be screaming at the top of your lungs at your kids if Hashem were in the room? Would you be having that fight if Hashem were in the room? Would you be... Your, our whole life will improve. Our whole life will be transformed. Our whole life will be different if we take a moment and say, how would I react in this situation if Hashem were in the room? Would I forward that email? Would I this, that, or the other? How would I behave if Hashem were in the room? In each moment, we would, we would be different. And that's the, that's the bracha and that's the promise. Work on this attribute, succeed in this attribute, and you'll see the peros, you'll see the, the uh, incredible bracha, the incredible blessing that will come as a result.
I want, that's the end of the Chazan Isha's Amun and Bitachon. I'll tell you a quick thought on this week's parsha. We have time for a quick thought. Yeah, we have time for a quick thought on this week's parsha. So, uh, is this for me? Esti. Yeah. Thank you so much. This week's parsha is Chukas. Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the Chuk of the Torah. The commentaries ask, and then the Torah goes on to tell us the laws of Parah Aduma. If an individual is impure through contact with the corpse, the way they become purified is by the sprinkling of uh, ashes mixed with water, and the ashes are produced from a red heifer, a para aduma. Why should that work? It's a, it's a paradoxical rule. The one who purifies the other becomes impure themselves. It makes no sense. If the mixture, if the recipe I'm holding is enough to purify you, why should I become impure in the process? It's the classic paradox. Even Shlomo Amalek said, um, Shlomo Melch said, I wanted to become wise. I tried to understand Parah Aduma. It's so far away from me. I couldn't understand it. It's a chok. So, Parsha begins, Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the chok. And the commentaries ask, what do you mean Zos Chukas HaTorah? This is the chok of the whole Torah. Chok is a rule that, that we can't comprehend, that I can't understand. This isn't the whole Torah. This is one narrow, specific rule. This is one law. Namely, para Aduma. It should have said, Zos Chukas Hapara, zos chukas hatahara. This is the law having to do with purification or having to do with the red heifer. What do you mean zos chukas hatorah? I think it was the Orachayim. I don't remember where I saw this, but the or- somebody explains what it means is the following: a chok is a law that I don't understand. My attitude towards observing that which I don't understand reflects my true attitude towards that what I'm doing that I do understand. What do I mean? If I only observe mitzvot that make sense to me, that I understand, that do something for me, am I worshipping Hashem or am I worshipping my life and my lifestyle and myself? If I'm only willing to do what makes sense to me, what enhances my life, what enriches me, what I see, I'm not really in a relationship with God at all. So, like, I have a good friend who's an atheist. He says he's an atheist, but I think he's a big believer. But he says he's an atheist. But he's been doing a lot of Shabbos. I said, like, what's the deal? Why I would go to the beach. What are you doing with Shabbos if you're an atheist? He says, you know, I don't believe in God, but the Shabbos thing is a good thing. Time with family, disconnecting from technology, it enhances my life. It's, a, it's an objectively good thing. It's reasonable. I like it. It's good. So I do it. I said, well, that person is not in a relationship with God. They're in a relationship with themselves. And that's true for every area of life. If you say, you know, I keep kosher because it's, it's cultivating a sense of discipline within me. It's good. It's good for me. So you're not really in a relationship with God, you're in a relationship with yourself. How do you know if everything you're doing is really about God or is about you? And the answer is, in your attitude towards the chok. It's the same is true in marriage. In marriage, you know, a lot of times a spouse asks the other spouse to do something. You say, well, that's reasonable, that makes a lot of sense. Could you please make the plane tickets for our vacation? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm all in, give me a keyboard, get me the computer, I'm all in. That makes a lot of sense, I'm all in. Then the spouse says, would you... Do something, and it makes no sense to you. It makes no, I could do that later. I don't have to do it in that way or with that person. And they're trying to convince you, but but I'm asking you to. You say, but that doesn't make sense. But I'm at, listen. We've gone in circles fifteen times. You're not going to understand why I'm asking you to. If you love me, you want me to be happy. I'm asking you to. It's in that moment that the rest of the entire relationship is determined. Is everything you're always doing because it makes sense to you and it works for you and it enhances you so it never ever is really about me? Or is it always somewhat about me but it happens to be good for you too? How will you know the answer to that question? In those moments where it doesn't make sense to you and are you willing to do it for me anyway? So that's why Zos Chukas HaTorah. The Para Aduma is not just about the Para Aduma. The attitude towards the Para Aduma is about all of Torah and Mitzvahs. Is it about us or is it about Hashem. So part of Amun and Bitachon, living a life of Amun and Bitachon, is to understand and recognize that as we go through life, it's not just about what makes sense to us. It's about forfeiting and submitting ourselves to Hashem. And in those moments of greatest challenge where we don't have clarity and we don't understand, our capacity to forfeit and submit in those moments reflects on all the rest of our life of the Amun and Bitachon. Is it really genuine? And is it something which is really real? There won't be any divorces <clears throat> if you live that way, right? Mm-hmm. There shouldn't Hopefully. be. <laughs> there shouldn't be. There always are anyway. Not everybody's compatible. There are irreconcilable differences. Yes, that's but true. yeah, <laughs> living a mindfulness of Hashem will enhance every area of life in general. All right, have a fantastic week, everybody. Okay, recording.